of good character. That that's good. I yeah, I like that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, well, for me, reading a little bit ahead of the Proverbs, um, if you're the same person, you know, have good character behind closed doors as, as well as, in, you know, in open doors, I think it's, I think, you know, you have good character because everybody can see who you are. Okay. Anybody else? Or anything else? If anybody comes to you for advice, to a degree. To a degree, but yeah. I've heard a lot of really stupid people <laughs> get asked their advice. But but I think there might be something there, though. Being around other people, other people that are uh, in a, uh, be beneficial to you. Okay. Being around people are Christians who then who also have a good church. Yes. Okay, kind of like maybe it'll rub off on me, kind of stuff. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Well, I mean, in a, where good people be around good people, birds of a feather. Oh, okay. So about. judge yourself by your friends. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got you. So does that mean? Does that mean I can make myself feel very really good by getting by a bunch of really dumb people and being like, Haha, I'm so smart. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anything else? Um, I think you'd show fruits of the spirit. Oh, the Christian response. <laughs> she had to go there. She did. Anything else? <coughs> I mean, I want you guys to really delve deep on this question. What do you think, I think of yourself? If, I think if people entrust stuff to you, uh -huh. that shows that you have good character. Because they they give you responsibilities, they trust you with stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. They're not going to just do that to anybody. Right? Unless they're gossip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't turn your back on people? Okay. And um, when people give you counsel um, on something you're doing wrong, you don't just you can go in one ear and out the other. You okay. actually listen and make a change. Okay, are you reading notes? Uh -huh. Me? Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, she's 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 uh, Wait, that's my notebook. No, I'm just oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anything else? I told you, you gotta lock your computer so you can't get on there. <laughs> I tried, it deleted another PowerPoint. <laughs> Anything else? When you think of you and you think, I'm a decent person, what do you base that off of? How do you know if you actually are, are what? Actions. Okay. Because what's in your heart is going to come out, so what you do. Even if you have bad intentions, they're not real eventually to know. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? How you were raised. In some degree. How so? The origin experiences. Like, what do you mean? Well, if you were from a strict family unit, maybe have some... Be able to keep uh, that up from good character. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Anything else? I think. What is your motivation for the mm. things that you do? Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on. If you what, was that her or was that you? That's her. That's her. She had something to say. <laughs> uh, if anybody else has something, just let me know, okay? So we're in Proverbs 27. Wow. 
I feel like I feel like uh, once we finish Proverbs, we're going to be losing a dear friend. Because we're going to be finishing Proverbs right about the same time that we're finishing Psalms and, and Sunday nights. Oh, no. Yeah, buddy. What am I going to do? And, you know, um, you, Cheryl Evans' husband, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. John, yes, thank God. John Evans, I, I know the guy. Why did I blink on his name? Uh, he suggested that I uh, start over in Psalms, and I was like, oh, no, I can't do that again. <laughs> Uh, what am I going to do this time when I get to Psalm 119? I can't go through that again. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so, ver starting in verse 1 here. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And, you know, this, this, this proverb is kind of important to me because all throughout Proverbs he's been talking about, you know, wise planning. You know, think about what's ahead, you know, wisdom, discernment, all these things. And then here is this little nugget that says, okay, yes, but with all that all that planning, that doesn't give you the ground for prideful boasting. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. When I retire, I'll have all this money to retire with. Don't look at what tomorrow may bring. Okay, don't boast about tomorrow. Uh, for you do not know what the day may bring. You don't know if something's going to happen in the meantime that will wipe out your retirement plan. You don't know if something's going to happen, you know, that you'll lose your job tomorrow. Oh, I got this promotion at work. I'm such a good worker. I'm better than everybody else. And it's like, well, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> um, exactly. So, verse 2. Let another praise you and do not, um, and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. Again, going with the theme of prideful boasting. And then verse 3. Uh, a stone is heavy, and sand is weighty, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. And what that means, basically, is fools make problems others have to endure. A fool's provocation, a, a fool's um, stirring the pot, a, a fool's um, not leaving things alone. Provoking. What? Yes, provoking. Let me turn this down here. Felt like the dual cry was a little much for the recording. <laughs> okay, uh, verse 4. We're at this cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? That one's pretty simple. Uh, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Now here's the one that has a, a few different... People go back and forth about what it means. And I think this one's plain enough. Love requires rebuke. We're not talking about... We're not talking about... Um, uh, a rebuke behind closed doors, that, that's called gossiping and complaining. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an open rebu rebuke where you go to the person and you say, look, you know, this, you know, you're doing this or, or, or whatever, you know, something that's open. Because if you really love someone, you can't, well, I'm just going to, you know what I mean? And there's there. this is something that people blow out of proportion. That means every single time that I see anything, I have to hop down people's throat, right? No. That means I have to really jump on them and let them know what's what. No. You know, don't go to the other extreme. All that it's saying is that love requires rebuke. Okay? Love requires that. Um, and then also there, there's, there's a few other ways you can read this too. Um, it's better to... Um, Ten, that, that somebody says harsh words to you than, than somebody than somebody supposedly loves you but doesn't show it. You know, just a few different ideas there. Um, but I think the one that makes the most sense is that you know the two the two ideas being connected, um, rebuke being connected with love. Because why, why else would he say open rebuke and then hidden love? You know, why would he contrast those two things unless they were somehow connected? So, just the one that makes sense, most sense to me. Uh, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Once again, going exactly with this, this, this verse is tied in with that previous verse there. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So basically, an enemy will, 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 will butter you up, they'll, they'll make things, they'll smooth things over. Whereas, a, a friend that says something um, that hurts your feelings, that's faithful, you can trust that, because that person really does care about you. They don't have a hidden love. They have an, they have an actual love for you, right? Um, one who is full uh, loathes honey. Um, you know, and I will say this. A lot of times Christians try to speak to complete strangers as though they were close friends. You have to build that. Yeah. More. Yeah, and here's the thing. Don't ever get to know somebody just so you can tell them what they're doing wrong either. People can people can sense when you're when you're ta when you have ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. um, get to know somebody because you want to get to know them. 
or because they're worth getting to know or something. But do it for good reasons. Don't right. just right. don't use people. People are not you know. Um, yeah. Um, what are those called? Moist towelettes. Um, one who is full loathes honey. Now to loathe something means to detest it, to hate it. Okay. Uh, but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. See, even the bitter thing is sweet to somebody who, who, who's hungry. Um, the idea here, um, obviously, you don't know what you have, have so you don't have it. This is what goes for, for more than just honey, though. Mm -hmm. This goes for, for experiences as well. You know what I mean? Um, well, I don't like my church. I don't do, do, do. So you go somewhere else and it's like, well, maybe I didn't have it so bad there. You go, complain and complain and complain about your job, but then you get fired and you don't have a job. Well, gee, I, I'd take any job over not having a job and having to live on the streets. See what I mean? The same, same kind of an idea there. Um, someone who someone who, who has and, and doesn't have that want, you know, they they get more picky about the stuff. They, they overlook stuff. They, they start to be less thankful for it. You know, like, uh, oh, I hate that I had to waste 12 years of my life in, in high school, or, or I mean, not in high school, I'm sorry, in school. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're in high school for 12 years, there's probably a problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but then you go to the people who don't even know how to read, you know, and uh, don't know how to write, and it's like, well, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing. Um, so, okay. Uh, verse 8. Like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Now, this one had me puzzled for a little bit. Yeah. And the idea is this. Pointless loss of security. Oh. What? Oh, sorry, friend. Are you still writing down? Okay. You're good? Okay. And the idea is this. A pointless loss of security. Looking for happiness out there. Leaving the nest thinking you're going to find something when the truth is it was right back there when you left it. Where you left it. Sorry, where you left it. So it's the same as a bird strays from its nest. Is the same. It's the same as a man who strays far from its home, from his home. You know, all, all, all out there. You know, and the thing is, well, you need to go right, and you need, he goes back to his actual home, and that's where his. You know what I mean? That's where his. So the idea here is not you. When you leave the home looking for this, you're gonna. You're abandoning your security. You're abandoning your your connection there. Um, you're not gonna find happiness out there. Okay, great. Uh, verse nine. Do you may have questions on that? Well, I kind of experienced that. I kind of thought that I left, home, left here, went to Idaho, went to Nevada, and then you realized that. Yeah. That was <laughs> Yeah. That's why I decided to never leave. I'm like, everybody comes back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang. Did you hear what he just said, Grace? If we're going to move out, we can't move back until Chuck dies. Okay? <laughs> no, verse 9. Uh, oil and perfume make the heart glad. Now, now here there were a few different uh, readings. One is, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Okay, another one is, and so does the sweetness of a friend that comes from his uh, earnest counsel. And and the the actual Hebrew on a lot of these is, is a little difficult. Um, I was looking at, at, at um, a lot of translations and editors taking apart the Hebrew. And, um, I know just enough to kind of figure out what they're saying. And uh, like I say, my talent is in Greek, not in Hebrew. <laughs> For one, did you know Hebrew writes right to left? That's nonsense, yo. That's nonsense. He goes left to right. That's that's the right way. They're yeah. wrong. They're yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and so uh, this one, I'm not really going to trouble you with the other possible translations of this because I really think that, that this really really hits pretty close to what Sol uh, Solomon uh, meant. Uh, and, and the idea that there kind of goes along with what he was talking about earlier that that uh, there's a certain there's a certain greatness, a certain sweetness. Um, with with uh, with a friend giving you counsel that that's it's actually meant for your good. There's just a sweetness there, and it's like oil and perfume. It makes your heart glad. It, it's you know, no reason to complicate this with all those other translations that are possible. Um, verse ten: <clears throat> Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who's near. Than a brother who's far away. Now, some of the translators were trying to say that this was a later insertion from somebody who didn't have a good relationship with their brother. And I was like, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> I mean, like, I guess on paper, kind of, you know, something. But you have to assume a few things with that kind of mindset. You have to assume that the Bible had later um, 
edits afterwards that were unintended by God, and they just kind of sneaked them in. And it, that's kind of disconcerting for me. I don't really like, like to believe that. So even if it was true, I don't think I would like to believe that. Um, but then also, another thing that makes it complicated is is the different... The different... Okay, so, you know, we guys, you guys know we don't have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible, right? Like all ancient literature, they got lost. Mm -hmm. They got destroyed. There's just time. But we have dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of copies. Okay? And some of the different copies we have, the Old Testament are in different languages. One of them is called the Septuagint. That's basically the Greek version or Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Basically. <coughs> Then there's the Targums and all those different ones. You know, basically there's there's the, the copies of the Hebrew text, the copies of it and 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 Aramaic and all those different ones. Um, and when you compare these different versions and translations, they have differences, not big differences, but minor enough where we can't know exactly what was originally said. And because of that. Some of these proverbs are just a little bit difficult to figure out what he's trying to say because he already said it in a cryptic way, but then we don't know exactly what he said. So the cryptic statement is even more cryptic in that we don't even know if we have it the correct way. We have a most likely, which is the one that's probably in your Bible if you use an ESV or NASB. Then you have one that's just trying to explain it in a simpler way, which sometimes misses the mark, as in NIV, NLT, that kind of stuff. Then you have ones that just don't even care, which I'm not even going to get into those, like the message, for instance. <laughs> um, and so, with this, what the ESV says is probably true, and this is probably what Solomon originally said. But that still leaves us with the question of why is the brother treated here in such a negative sense, whereas in, what was it, chapter 17, I think it was chapter 17, he said that a brother was born for the times of adversity. Right. So you have this whole, why, why, why did Solomon suddenly change his mind on this? And I don't think that he changed his mind at all. I think that sometimes we read into something that's not there. So let me just go to this. Don't forsake others when they need you. Let's look at that first. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. Don't forsake others when they need you. But, don't beg for people to be there for you. Right. Okay? And do not go to your brother's house in the, in the day of your calamity. Going and begging for someone, for some, see what I mean? And, and which brings us to a last idea, being available is better than being related. You can be a brother and be very, very distant. Like this brother who, who he had to go to him in his day of calamity. Or you can be the friend who's there for people. See what I mean? And so it doesn't really, in my opinion, it's not saying that the brother is, is, is portraying a brother in a, in a bad sense here. All that it's saying is that to be, a be, uh, to be an available friend is better than being related to somebody. You know? You see people saying the same thing nowadays, don't you? Where they say things like, um, well, he's my, he's my actual brother because he really, he's my actual father because he was there for me. He's my actual son because, see what I mean? Yeah. You see people talking like this all the time nowadays. And, and I think that that's really what he's trying to say. He was just contrasting the difference where, I mean, look at the difference in, in what was it, verse 10. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. So it's just the, differ the, the difference there from a brother to your father's friend. Like, we're talking about people who are only distantly connected with you. See? And still treating it, being there for those people. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. And I think that that kind of summarizes what, what the proverb is about, that last part of chapter 10, or verse 10, sorry. Um, so, once again, I don't really feel like that is a, um, what is it called, when it, a contradiction of what Pro Solomon said earlier. I think he's just emphasizing a different point. Verse 11, be wise, my son, and make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. Now, this one really connects with those earlier Proverbs where, it's, where I was talking about the way that um, uh, how we act reflects on other people and it brings honor and shame to people and that kind of stuff. Even though we aren't an honor shame society, the, the principle is still true. And when we act um, wise, like this says here, we do honor to our parents. And notice that what he says here, that I may answer him who reproaches me. If we act foolishly, it reflects poorly on our parents' ability as parents. Whereas if we <laughs> act wisely... Then when people attack the character of our parents, they have something to, to, to rebuttal with. Look at my child. See what I mean? Our children reflect our ability to, to, to parent, regardless of whether we like it or not. And uh, so if we have a child that chooses to act wisely, it's going to give us something to, 
you know, to, to stand honored in. So, <clears throat> verse uh, 12. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. See, uh, this one I actually did want to take a little note there. Wisdom yields a discerning heart. There are some things that you will foresee and that you will be able to prevent just from being wise. That you never would have even seen. You would have just walked right into it because you weren't wise. See what I mean? Um, should I take this job? Well, hold on a second. This might be a terrible idea. See what I mean? Um, oh, man, I hate it when my nose is itchy. Uh, verse 13. Take a man's garment when he has put up security for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for an adulteress. Now, there's uh, there's an uh, alternate reading that could potentially yield puts up security for a uh, for a foreigner. Um, in fact, some of your Bibles might actually say that. Um, adulteress seems to be the correct one, but foreigner is still still holds true to the to the idea of it. I have a way, way word. Woman. Woman. Okay. Um, okay. So. Is everybody done with the slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sighing, is it that terrible? <laughs> no, most of it got erased, so I didn't retype it. No! Uh, people must be held accountable, especially when it's a foolish decision. See, the, um, what he's saying here, take a man's garment when he has put up security for a stranger. Basically, what, how they did it is if you didn't have the thing that you promised to pay, the, to pay for it, you would give what's called a pledge. Basically, a promise that you will pay what was agreed upon. Now, that promise could take the form of anything you had on you. Um, a, 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 a ring, you know, whatever. Let's say I'm carrying this pillow with me. Here, I'm giving this pillow and pledge that I will come back and pay whatever I owe you. Okay? You see this in, in Genesis, like, chapter 38 or something like that, where Judah ends up accidentally <laughs> having sex with his son's... Daughter. No, son's, sorry, son's wife. Yes. <laughs> really a twisted, gross thing that happens there. Yeah. Um, and he gives her a pledge for sleeping with him. He gives her um, his cord, his signet, and his staff. Um, but then when he comes back with the sheep, because he didn't just walk around with sheep, you know. <laughs> and just in case I find a prostitute, you know. Uh, uh, but then when he came back with the sheep, she wasn't there. And they said, there is no occult, pre occult prostitute here. There's, there's, she, there's, there's no one, there's none that been, that's been here. So he's like, okay, whatever. And he goes on his way. He finds out that it's his son's uh, wife. Uh, and so then, when when she goes to get be put to death, she says, ah, whoever owns these things is the father of this of this child. And he's like, oh, that's my stuff. Never mind. Don't kill her. Yeah. <laughs> so awkward. <Let's> see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you see what I mean? Uh, that would, that's how they how they did things back then. They had a pledge. Um, so what he's saying here in verse 13, take a man's garment when he has put up security for a stranger. You giving pledge for a total stranger, for an adulteress, for, for a foreigner, for someone who you know nothing about. This is a complete stupid decision. So what you should you do? You should hold them responsible for it. Uh, people must be held accountable, especially when it was a foolish decision. Foolish, de foolish decision. Now this isn't, t isn't taking into account being merciful and overlooking things. It's simply pointing out the fact that... Um, that it's just a foolish... The, the point of the proverb is to, is to teach you it is a very stupid thing to put up security for someone else. You wouldn't co-sign on a stranger's loan, would you? You wouldn't give a stranger your credit card, would you? You wouldn't do those things, right? Well, if you, if you are that stupid, you should still have to pay for it. Because that's just stupid. That's basically what he's saying. He's not saying, hey, go and find these people and be merciful, merciless to them. He's not saying that. He's, in, he's, he's telling you, hey, it's not wise to do that. Don't do that. Okay, so verse 14. Uh, Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, will be counted as cursing. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Now, there's two actually two different uh, ways that this could be understood. The first is, is, is the way that I always understood it. Um, an untimely and loud greeting is not appreciated, right? Like, if somebody's in a time of mourning and you walk into the funeral, hey, how you doing? Yeah. If somebody just barely wakes up and they're still arguing, hey, hey, hi. See what I mean? It's going to be like, ah, shut up, stop talking. <laughs> you see what I mean? Which is the way I've always understood it. But there's also um, so, uh, a different uh, understanding that, that I just was familiar, uh, acquainted with today. And that's this, um, a, hypocr a hypocrite trying to overcompensate to prove his righteousness. 
um, in verse 14 here. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, or trying, to or trying to overcompensate for his hypocrisy, rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. So he's trying to prove himself. Oh, I, I'm a good person. But he's, what does it say? The, the lady doth protest too much. Kind of the same here. The, the hypocrite doth protest too much. Try, you're, trying, you're trying too hard. And that's what people say. You're, you're trying too hard uh, to prove your innocence. And so it really could be either or. Um, it, it really is difficult to figure out which one. So I wrote down both. What? I actually understood something else in my book. Is this like that crazy thing you were saying a couple weeks ago? Because that thing was straight up cray cray. I still don't know what you were talking about. <laughs> Yeah, you you do, Chuck. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where she was going off on God knows what. I understood it as when you're blessing someone, don't make it an inconvenience for them. Well, that is there too. Uh. Yeah, well, I mean, there's no reason in not saying that. It's not a it's not a stupid thing. So, you know, it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. That you guys want to remember that because that is something that's actually true. A lot of times people do that where they're all like, let me help you, but it's going to be in the most inconvenient time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, hey, right now, that time that you're working on your school, I've decided to come over and help you install that whatever it is. Well, I'm really thankful, but at the same time, this is my, the only time I had to study for this. Can we do right. it some other time? Right. Well, I made time in my calendar to come by. And it's like, and I appreciate it. Really, I do. But I really got this stuff to do. I've known a lot of people who do that, and then they make you feel make you feel bad about it too. It's like, look, I'm sorry, but you should have called ahead or something. Come on, I mean, come on. <laughs> Anyways, do what? Right, the guilt trips. The guilt trips. <laughs> oh, the guilt trips. Like if you guys watch um, Community, um, how Shirley, uh, the the main uh, African American character. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I said African American. Oh. Um, okay, let me say it differently. The main Christian character. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I don't see color. <laughs> uh, uh, the, well, anyways, um, she does this thing of, of, of guilt tripping people into things, you know, like, Oh, I thought you were going to go to my thing for Christmas. That's okay. <laughs> anyways. Uh, verse 15, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind, or to grasp oil in one's right hand. Now, I don't know if you've ever grasped something that was oily, but your hand slides right off it. Uh -huh. The idea here is that the woman, you can't, uh, you can't control her. You can't, uh, just... Brooke, have you ever tried to uh, keep the wind, the New Mexico wind, from tearing up your plants through that? In the when it gets windy? Right. <laughs> No, stop, from, wind! From taking your trash can three blocks down. <laughs> your, your tree that you just planted. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah. Um, and, you know, this doesn't just go for wives either. This is this is something with spouses in general. It's, uh... Sometimes with spouses we can just make problems. Uh, verse 17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Really, a lot of the verses in this chapter are really connected. This one, I mean, goes right hand in hand with what we were just talking about, um, with how we kind of build on each other. We, we, we strengthen each other. We, we sharpen each other's skills, um, which is what Zach was saying, but the opposite is actually true, too. What does it say that Paul says, uh, bad company corrupts good morals? Uh -huh. um, whoever uh, tends a fig tree excuse me, will eat its fruit, and he who guards his master will be honored. And the idea here is that faithfulness yields rewards. If you stick to something, there's going to be a good result. Right. Well, a, a result. Obviously, if you stick to something like, I'm going to finish pornography strong. I started it strong. I'm going to finish it strong. Well, obviously, that doesn't yeah, count. I'm going to finish this line of coke real strong. <laughs> real strong. I'm going to make sure I finish the whole cigarette pack. <laughs> the whole 12 pack. I'm going to drink all of it. It's like, well. Uh, it's not saying that. It's saying when you, sti when you stick to, to working hard and to doing what's right, you it will yield a resor result. Is that positive? Uh, verse uh, 19, uh, as, in, as in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects the, the man. Now, this is how it literally reads in Hebrew, just so you know how complicated this is, okay? As water, face to face, um, how does it go? Um, so heart um, reflects man, or heart man reflects, or heart man to man, or something like that. It's like, what? You could have said that any clearer than that? Come on! 
Yeah. So I, your 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 English Bible adds a lot of words in on this, but that's just because it was virtually un un, un, un understandable. Mm -hmm. It didn't translate well. Let's just put it like yeah. that. It didn't translate well. Yeah. So they added a bunch of words, yes, because they had to. Right. Uh, yeah, so anyways, the idea here is actually a lot simpler than it looks. Um, examine your attitudes to see who you really are. As you can see, your face when you look into the water, so you, so your heart is going to, it's going to reflect you. You know what I mean? So let me read it once again. As in water, the face reflects the face, so the heart of man reflects the man. If you really want to know who you are, look at look at your attitudes. Look at the things you are behind closed doors. Look at look at what you're justifying. See what I mean? Really, a, a good way to uh, what is it called? Um, self. Oh, what is it called? Self awareness. Self contemplation. What? Self reflection. Yes. Yes. Um, now, obviously, this can be skewed because sometimes we don't really look honestly. We look for what we want to see. Right. And so, obviously, this. Uh, oh, to a lot of times, we are blinded by things in ourselves. Blinded right. by the light. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Um, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied and never satisfied out of the eyes of man. Um, both of these things kind of are, are go hand, hand in hand the same way as death is never satisfied, it's always consuming people. So in the same way, um, the eyes of men are never satisfied. So this is good news actually. You know how you're always, you're always greedy for getting that thing you've always wanted? Don't feel bad, that's just because you're a person. Hey! <laughs> um, but anyways, and the idea there is that you're never going to get fully satisfied as long as you keep looking with your earthly eyes. Um, verse 21 there, The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, and a man is tested by his praise. So here's another thing that shows who you really are. How you handle praise shows who you really are. When you're put on the spotlight, who are you? I know people talk a lot about who you are behind closed doors, and I completely stand by that. But you can tell a lot about who you really are by when, they put, when you're put on the spotlight. You did really good, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, best job ever. I know. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the best around. Anyways. Uh, so, verse uh, 22, I guess. Uh, crush a fool in mortar with a pestle, along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. I don't know if you guys know what mortar and pestle is. It's basically simplified version here. Uh, a little bowl and this like, uh, uh, rock that you crush stuff with. For all, it's just, there's no reason to make that overly complicated. Um, so basically the idea here is even if um, you cannot force a fool not to be foolish. Foolishness is his character. Even when he's put under, under, under duress, when he's put under pressure, that's still his character. And you can't demand it out of him. If you have a foolish child... Can you force him to not be foolish? No. See, there's this prime time that you can chase foolishness out of a person. It's called when they're a child. And it's called with a belt. <laughs> and sadly, we oftentimes miss that opportunity because we don't spend the time that we should with our kids. We wait too long to spend the time that we should with our kids. We correct them either with too much anger or with not, not enough uh, faithfulness to it. You know, we either let them get away with murder or we ride them for everything. Um, you know, and we miss these golden opportunities, and uh, as a result, you know, it has an effect. For instance, um, I forgot exactly the, the statistics. This is an exact, precise thing. But somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of people who are in jail, men who are in jail, uh, did not have an active father figure. So that goes to show you what this power was talking about. Um, your ability to learn, adapt, mature, and listen shows who you really are. Somebody said this tonight. I forgot who. Was it you? Was it you? The ability to learn and... and, and um, is that you? Uh, to change your form from right. you to right. that would be actually. So these kinds of things, they show who you really are. Um, was everybody done with that last slide? Did I skip too fast? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, that one really got me because I was like, wait, so I can't beat it out of them? I can't just yell out enough and they'll change? Because I've met a lot of stupid people. I can't just, <laughs> just fix it. <laughs> Well, no, you can't. And see, the thing is, so is a foolish person forever doomed to be a fool? No. No. If they 
make the choice to change, yeah. but you cannot make it for them. Right. You know, going back to kind of what you said about needing, you know, having to have like a positive figure in your life. I seen this story on Facebook one day, and this guy and his son were in, I think it was like Walmart or something, and they bought a slushie. Okay. And his son spilled it everywhere. Well, sorry, keep on. <laughs> instead of getting mad, he just helped him to clean it up and turn it into a learning opportunity instead of just yelling at it. That's gross. If you beat him, he, he won't spill again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can make them clean up. Like, I ain't doing that again, but I don't want to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Nicole. Great example. But you beat yeah. them and then make them clean. Right. <laughs> but in public, so people know you had nothing yes. to do with it, and he's a failure. <laughs> okay. Uh, verse uh, 23 then. Uh, know well the condition of your flocks. Now, now these verses are all connected. Verse 23 through 27 is like one long uh, poem. Okay? Uh, know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever. And does a crown endure to all generations? When the grass is gone, and the new growth appears, and the vegetation of the mountains is gathered, the land will provide your clothing, and the goats are the price of a field. There will be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and maintenance for your girls. So, really a lot is said here. So let me say the, the, the simplified version, and we'll get to the actual meat and potatoes here. It's a contrast to trusting God, whereas, you know, Proverbs has said a thousand times, trust in God, trust in God, trust in God. Here it's giving you the opposite side of that flip coin. Yes, you should trust in God, but you should be wise with your with your riches and with your belongings. You should be wise with those things. Oh, well, I'm trusting God, so I'm just going to throw my stuff out the door. It's like, well, no, you yeah. still need to take care of your stuff. You, right. you do maintenance on your cars. You, you, know, you, you, you clean your house. You wash your clothes. You, you do things like that to, to ensure that the things that God has given you last, you know, and, and that, you know, because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Right. However, you know, don't you don't stop trusting in God? This is just make sure that you don't take that to too far of an extreme. Because I've seen people do this. Yeah. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit in my house all day on Facebook, and I'm trusting in God to provide for me. My rent is due. Or my utilities are due. My kids are hungry, but but I'm going to trust in you. I don't think that that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. I'll pray about it. Nope, that's not how it works. Were you going to say something? Okay. Um, so once again, just kind of keeping things in balance. And that's one of the great things about Proverbs is it'll say something, and it'll say something else to kind of, it sounds like it's contradicting, but it's just giving balance to it. And why this is important, because a lot of people will read one verse, yank it out of context, like John uh, 14, 13, and not see the other side of that coin. Mm -hmm. So if you read through all of Proverbs, it does a pretty good job of showing both sides. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, people usually just read what they want to read. Matthew 7, 1, you can't judge me. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have nothing to say. Somebody should have told that to Paul when uh, when he was telling the telling the church of Corinth, you know, to, to handle the person who was having sex with his father's wife. <laughs> hey, no, 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 you can't judge him. No, Paul, you're wrong. Don't judge him. I'm judging him. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, okay, let's not read all of the Bible. Let's just read the parts that we want to hear. And The Bible will often do that, by the way. The Bible will oftentimes give things in perspective. For instance, the books of the law seem that, like they're really judgmental, right? Well, actually, if you read them after reading the Gospels, you see that they're full of love. The problem is, they didn't have the Gospels back then. So people thought the God was just this giant, like, hey. dictator that was just going to wipe people. You know what I mean? Like, he hated everybody. Right. Except for the Jews. You know? <laughs> but then, when Jesus came, he's like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. You know, it just completely changed everything that they had, they had thought. Right. You know? It's like the prophets, you know, oh, well, I'm just being a prophetic voice in my society telling people how wicked they are. Most of the prophets that came were sent to God's people. Not all of them, most of them. Right. Let's keep things in perspective here. So that probably means you shouldn't be yelling in Walmart parking lots and that kind of stuff. So let's keep things in perspective here. Going um, through malls in Texas saying Santa is a girl. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was so terrible. And you know what the thing is? is that guy felt like he was like... I'm doing the right thing. It's like, you're a psycho, man. <laughs> you're a psycho. Anyways. Um, so know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. That part's pretty simple. For riches do not last forever. That part's pretty simple. And does a crown endure to all generations. Now this is, is something interesting. Basically, his idea here is that no kingdom lasts forever. 
And that goes to 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 reinforce his point of what he's saying that, that nothing lasts forever. You you need to be prepared for these kinds of things. When the grass is gone, and notice that he uses the crown because that's you know the symbol of, of power and authority. If that doesn't even last for forever, then whoa, I really need to watch out for the lesser things, right? Uh, verse twenty five, when the grass is gone and the new growth appears. So basically the idea here is if if the plant life disappears, you still have your animals because you took care of them. Right. But what happens when calamity comes and you haven't taken care of your animals? You can't sell them, it says here, for the price of land. Look right here in verse 26. The goat, the price of a field, you can't sell them for anything because they're not good. You didn't take care of them. Um, and the lambs will provide you clothing. Oh, well, not if you didn't take care of them. Right. You have nothing for your clothes either. See what I mean? So what he's saying here is even when, even when other things disappear, you can be prepared for it to some degree. Right. You know, that kind of stuff. Basically having an uh-oh account, you know. Where you don't just have your checking account that you get to zero every time before you get paid. You have another account, like a savings account or something, that you put all money in. So in case your car suddenly breaks down, in case something happens where you get fired, in case well you have all money, so you can you're not down totally, up the creek. Yeah. In fact, uh, Joe and I were were, were messing with the class. It, nothing came of it, but we were uh, pastor was considering doing a uh, finances class, which may still be in the future sometime. Uh, and we were actually talking about one thing. Um, um, oh yes, I remember having having six months worth of bills uh, in a savings account. Um, that way, if you lose a, lose your job, you still have six months to find another job, which is a it's a good amount of time. You can usually pull crap together in six months. Right. I mean, not always, but you know, it, it's good to have it just in case. And that money, you don't touch it. It's not your oh well. I feel like getting an IC today. If you don't have money in your other account, don't get the IC. That's only for your uh oh. You know what I mean? And that's a really good idea. Right. Um, once again, though, you don't want to build up too much in savings accounts because uh, the American economy dollar is actually um, depreciating faster than interest rates are increasing your money. So putting your money in a savings account to earn money is actually losing money. Your money is becoming less valuable over time in the savings account. To really make it worthwhile, you have to actually invest in something like, a, what's it called, 401k Roth or whatever. Yeah. Um, 401k. I, IRA Roth. That's what I'm thinking of. An IRA Roth. Um, anyways. Uh, so, uh, verse 27, there will be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and maintenance for your girls. For you, the people who are working for you, everyone you're going to have enough because you've planned ahead. So, that takes us to chapter 28, which we're probably going to have to go through pretty fast, I'm thinking, huh? We didn't start on the lesson until really late. Either way, I will stop. Once that clock hits 8.10, I will stop, okay? Either way, no matter how far we get. Verse 1. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Righteous walk by faith, first off. So even when there are times of trouble, the righteous walk by faith, right? We trust in God in every in every moment, every situation. And secondly, righteous aren't suspicious. Whereas wicked people have a guilty conscience, so they are always suspicious. So it kind of has that dual meaning there. Verse 2. Is everything okay? Yeah, I thought I heard the thing we just outside. Okay. When, when a land transgresses, it has many rulers, but with a man of understanding and knowledge, its stability will not long uh, continue. This is another one that had a lot of different possibilities of, of translation. We're not really going to get into that because I really think that the SV kind of nails what, what the essence of what he's trying to say. Um, and the idea here is that rulers have an effect on their nation, but rulers will often be the result of the nation as well. Yeah. It kind of works both ways. Okay. Um, if the people are unrighteous, they're probably going to elect somebody who's unrighteous, right? Mm -hmm. Like how Hillary Clinton was even an option shows the corruption of America. Because no matter how corrupt and immoral she was, even some Christians were justifying her. That's we don't have to we don't have to stick so closely to a political platform that we overlook things that God condemns. Right. Let's remember that politics are second to our Christian walk. America, our, our, our allegiance as an American citizen is second to God as a Christian citizen. Remember that. Um, verse, uh, and yeah, I think that was all I was going to say about that one. Verse 3, a poor man who oppresses the poor is a beating rain that leaves no food. Now, some people assume that this should be translated um, a ruler who oppresses the poor, uh, based on if you change, if you change, make a very slight change on the Hebrew text. But that doesn't really make sense because that means that you have to assume 
that the, all the copies we have are wrong, and that what you think should be there instead, even though there's no proof of it, is right. I don't really see the Bible like that. I really don't. Um, I at least have to have some kind of proof for me to say, yes, what the Bible says is, is miscopied or mistranslated. Like, for instance, John chapter 8, where, you know, the oldest manuscripts, well, we don't even have that part. Okay, well, so it's still, you know, something that's good, but as long as you don't draw any principles that aren't clarified in the rest of Scripture. Well, okay, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, it's like I, I have a, I actually follow a different method of translating the Bible than a lot of other people. I have a, I have a scale system. I see Genesis to Deuteronomy as the most inspired parts of Scripture. Everything I read has to line up with what's in Genesis to Deuteronomy. And then I have, so here's Genesis to Deuteronomy, here's the rest of Scripture, and below that are any prophetic words that people give, any things like that, um, and, they, and they have to match up with not just the rest of the Bible, but specifically Genesis to Deuteronomy. Why do I have that? Because if you read through the prophets, they depend on the books of the law. Everything they say usually reflects the books of the law. Read through Deuteronomy, and then read through the prophets. Then go back and read through Deuteronomy, and you're going to see exactly what I mean. Deuteronomy is so closely tied to what the prophets have to say that you could say that they were just rewording the books of the law. Honestly, it's, it's that close. Like, it's just a, a phenomenal that people don't know the books of the law better because if you read the prophets, you you got the idea of it. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, the New Testament books, they spend how much time quoting the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> almost half the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament. So it's like, well, you know. Um, anyways... Um, I don't necessarily teach that for other people. That's just some, something that I do myself because it helps me to understand the books of the law better and helps me to kind of um, not feel like I'm smarter than the Bible. That kind of makes sense. Because what we do is we read the New Testament. We never touch the Old Testament. Then we draw our own conclusions on the New Testament. We don't even care what the Old Testament says. And we start teaching things for fact. Like, for instance, that don't judge me because of Matthew 7, 1. Okay, let's go back and read Genesis through Deuteronomy. And now let's go back and read that. And are you sure that that means what you think it means? Yeah. See what I mean? We're, we're, uh, anyways. Um, okay, so we were in verse 3, right? And so I, I, I think that this actually is, right, a poor man who oppresses the poor, because it's so ironic. That's the whole point of it. A poor man should be sympathetic to another poor man, but instead this poor man is oppressing the other poor man. It's like a, excuse me, like a beating rain that leaves no food. There's no sympathy. And so that brings us to another idea. Your actions can show who you really are. Can show. Some people are really great about hiding things and pretending, but it can show. Verse 4, those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive against them. I think that one's pretty simple. Any questions on, on this? I'm just going to go through the next couple ones because they're, they're, to, to me they're pretty simple. So if you have a question, I can totally go back and explain, okay? Verse 5, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Verse 6, Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity. You know, I want to go back to 5 there for a second. You know, really the basis for morality is God. Never forget that. If there is no God, there is no basis for morality. That would mean that without any divine intervention, we have done nothing but evolve from at least a similar ancestor of a monkey, if not a monkey, with no divine in 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 intervention. Which means that any form of morality is just something that we've made up for the sake of convenience or for the sake of feeling better about ourselves. But that brings up the question, why would we do it to feel better about ourselves? Why would we have to feel better about anything if there's no God? Right. We can feel better about whatever we want to feel, feel better about. You know what I mean? We can just live however we want. But the very fact that we have to make ourselves feel better about by inventing morality proves that we didn't invent morality. See what I mean? There's just kind of a circular a circular uh, argument that atheists get into that they just don't understand what they're saying. Right. So I really think that, that clarifies this. But those who seek the Lord understand it completely. By seeking God's ways, you understand right and wrong. You really get it. Verse 6, Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Now see, this goes against the prosperity teaching, doesn't it? No, that can't be right. If, if, if you walk in God's ways, you're going to be rich. Nope, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity. Better is a poor man that does the right thing than a rich man who's crooked in all his ways. And yes, crooked people can, uh, um, what is it called, uh, do well in life. Um, the one who keeps the law is a son with understanding, but a companion of glutton shames his father. Obviously, this goes back to what Zach says about um, not you are what you eat, but you are who you hang, out, hang around with. 
um, a companion of gluttons. Uh, verse 8, whoever multiplies his wealth by interest and profit, the idea here is um, interest and profit by charging the poor, not just interest and, and profit, um, gathers it for him who is generous to the poor. And so the idea here is that if you try and, and get wealthy by charging interest to poor people, what's going to happen is your wealth is going to eventually abandon you and go to someone else who was nicer to the poor. Mm -hmm. um, unjust financial gain will be lost and eventually go to one who is generous to the poor. Law prohibited charging interest to the poor. That was actually part of the law. In fact, that was in Ch Exodus chapter uh, 22. Verse, uh, let me just go there right now. Exodus 22. It's also in other places in the law. This isn't the only place it says this. Uh, 22, verse um, 25. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. So this is actually part of the law, and this, once again, isn't just an Exodus. This is repeated a couple times. So this is actually Ill illegal by the Israelite law to do. So keep that in mind when he says this. Um, whoever multiplies his wealth by interest and profit gathers it for him who is generous to the poor. In other words, God himself is going to make sure, he's going to make sure that, that, that that's going to come back on you. God, God is the one who, now understand the importance of this, God is the one who watches over the outcasts of society. Because they're not strong enough to defend themselves, so who's to say that we just take advantage of them? God himself. <coughs> See what I mean? And God himself is going to inter intercede on their behalf. That's kind of a powerful statement. It's like, oh, <laughs> never mind. Uh, and not only that, but it's kind of just a crooked thing to do. You see landlords do this too. What do they call them? Slumlords? Yeah. You know, where, where they take advantage of, of people. It's called slumlord, right? Um, and, and so anyways, whoever multiplies his wealth by interest gathers it for him who is generous to the poor. He's gathering it for someone else. It's not going to stick with him. He's gathering it for someone else. Someone later that God deems worthy to um, worthy to hold on to it. So verse nine: If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And I want to kind of dwell on this for a second. First off, God doesn't listen to those who refuse His ways. You can't live your own way and expect for God to listen to your prayers. Okay. Remember how I was preaching that one time in Leviticus, and I said about how the salt had to be with every every sacrifice. In the same way, Jesus has to be with our sacrifices. We cannot, oh, but I sacrifice to God. Yeah, but you're not living in submission to Jesus. Your sacrifice doesn't have the salt of God, which is Jesus. See what I mean? So in the same way, we cannot impress God by our works. If we really want to want our, our prayers to be heard, we have to come on his terms. But there is good news. If we are repentant and humble, even if we've lived an entire life, of refusing his ways. Even if we are currently struggling with refusing his ways, as long as we repent and stay humble, that means we're, we're, we're trying to t repent. To repent means to turn away from. Okay? We're, we're doing our best, and, and yes, we keep turning back to it, it seems, but you're making progress, you keep going, you keep seeking after the Lord, he'll hear, hear your prayers then, but if you try and live life on your own terms, it's not going to work. Uh, verse 10, whoever misleads the upright into an evil way will fall into his own pit. But the blameless will have a godly inheritance. Someone who's trying to mislead the upright, the righteous people. See, they'll be judged harsher than other people. And Jesus said it like this. If someone is to mis, misguide, basically, my, my ch children, if, you're, if, you, if you mistreat children, it's going to be worse for you than if you would have just had a millstone cast around your neck and be thrown into the sea. There are some things that God judges harsher, and yes, some sins that are worse than other sins. Now, all sin separates us from God, but not all sins yield, yield the same results. And if someone intentionally, like Richard Dawkins, for instance, intentionally attacks uh, righteous people, God's people, so as to turn them away, they will be judged harsher. Now, there is good news in all this. If we repent and turn from it, God, God doesn't refuse people who call on his name. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there is still hope for people like Richard Dawkins. Okay, I just want to put that out there. I'm not saying he has committed an unforgivable sin. I'm not saying that at all. You know, God knows his heart. But I, I do know that um, that God does judge some things harsher than other things. Verse 11. A rich man is wise in his own eyes. Now get this. A rich man, we're talking about a wealthy person, is wise in his own eyes. Okay, arrogant, basically. Which surely you've never known somebody like that, right? But a poor man who has understanding will find him out. A poor man who has an understanding will be able to see through his facade. But he's poor, but he's understanding. See, that's, that's the key phrase there. Um, verse 12, when the righteous triumph, there is great 
glory, but when the wicked rise, people hide themselves. I'm sorry, um, no, I didn't, never mind. But when the wicked rise, people hide themselves. Verse 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Now here is one of the most important proverbs tucked away here. This was something that wasn't revealed fully until the New Testament gospel. Yet Solomon has the wisdom to discern what true salvation was. Are hundreds of years before the before Jesus ever came. That's amazing. Um, so conf uh, confesses and forsakes. Now notice the two go hand in hand. If you forsake without confessing, you try to be a better person, right? I'm not going to confess. It's, I'm just going to let it go. But I'm I'm going to forsake my ways. Better. Yes, exactly. It just become it just becomes a thing where we're trying to compete. That doesn't do with God. We have to confess our sins to God and then forsake them. Um, and then if we try to uh, confess without forsaking, we get prideful sinfulness. Yeah, I did that. Probably do it again, too. Do you know what I mean? We just get prideful in our sin. We need for, uh, con to confess and forsake. To confess and repent. See, those two go hand in hand. The, the, the fact that Solomon was able to discern this is just really shows that God really did give him his wisdom. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Pointing to the mercy and grace of God before Jesus ever made that known. So the, the view that, the, view that um, the Israelites, the Jews, had no way of knowing about salvation before Jesus is completely false. If they really did read the word, at least Solomon's Proverbs, they would have caught on. But this was, this was something that was in Genesis through Deuteronomy as well. They just weren't paying attention. <laughs> and the prophets hinted to it. They weren't paying attention with that either. Solomon wrote it here in the Proverbs. They still weren't paying attention. Well, then Jesus came, and guess what? They didn't pay attention. And that's why Jesus told that parable, you know, of the guy who sent all, all the, all the. I'm sorry, about how God sent all the, all the um, prophets and everything, and about how they killed them all. Or how uh, the man sent all the workers to the vineyard, and they killed them. And so he sent his son, thinking, surely they'll respect my son. And, you know, for the, for the workers of the vineyard, and the workers of the vineyard kill him too. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of what Jesus was talking about with all these different parables. I'm referencing two or three right now. Uh, verse 14, Blessed are, uh, is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. That really goes hand in hand with verse 13. Uh, verse 15, Like a roaring lion or charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. <laughs> verse 16, A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor, but he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. Um, if one is burdened with the blood of another, sorry, was, was did somebody say something? No. Okay. Uh, if, if one is burdened with the blood of another, he will be a fugitive until death. Let no one help him. Now, this is another verse, another verse that in the Hebrew it is very cryptic, very cryptic. You thought the face face thing was confusing. This one, I didn't even know what it was trying to say. Thank God, there's other there's people who, who translate Hebrew. That's what they do. Because I, if I had to do this, I'd be like, I don't know what he's thinking here. Um, but anyways, and so this this really is is a, a pretty pretty probably what he's saying in the ESV here. Um, co uh, compassion cannot be absolute. The charge must serve their sentence. That's the idea of it. You can't have absolute compassion. You know what I mean? It, it, compassion is good, but remember that there is a place where compassion has to end and judgment has to begin. Think about church discipline. If all the pastor showed ever was compassion. And there was no no discipline whatsoever. Everybody just did whatever they felt like doing. Well, the pastor really isn't leading, then, is he? But at the same time, a pastor can show compassion to like one or two people that don't deserve it, even for years, and it'd be okay. See what I mean? So keep this is kind of keeping things in perspective here. Um, or think about you know a, a president who doesn't enforce the law, policemen who don't enforce the law. There has to be some kind of standard. <clears throat> so what he's saying here. <clears throat> in verse 17, uh, is that if one is burdened with the blood of another, if someone is, is, is a murderer, um, you know, a charged murderer, notice how he says there, he will be a fugitive until death, a charged murderer, you can't just let him go. Oh, I'm just showing him compassion. He's a charged murderer, and he needs to stand the trial. Not only that, but don't forget that in the Old Testament, God required 
blood for blood. If someone killed somebody, they had to pay it back with blood. Now, if there's an accidental death, um, there was something called a city of refuge, which were scattered throughout the 12 tribes, um, which they could flee to there. But if they ever left the city and were killed, the murder was justified. So you really had to stay in that city until the person... No, no, no. It was until the next high priest died, or it was until the next judge died. I forget which. Um, it was it the judge? Um, which could potentially be 50 years, or it could be, you know, a couple months. You know, you really don't know. Because uh, you don't know when somebody's going to die. Um, so then verse 18 here. Whoever walks in integrity will be delivered, but he who is crooked in his ways will suddenly fall. Verse 19. Uh, whoever works his, his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. Now, does this sound like somebody who says, follow your dreams? Or get rich quick schemes. Yeah, it sounds like both of those, honestly. Or the, or the um, prosperity gospel. You just declare it. Well, I think this contradicts all of those. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. Basically, you work and you'll get paid. Very simple idea here. Uh, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. I can fly. <laughs> Anyways, verse 20. A faithful man will abound with, um, abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Now, this one was pretty interesting to me. Um, money cannot be your focus, basically. See, this man, it doesn't say a poor man, it says a faithful man will abound with blessings. A faithful man. But then it contrasts the faithful man, not with, not with you know, the unfaithful person. It says, whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Because when, when, when the pursuit of money is our focus, it leads us to all kinds of immoral things. We're willing to commit wickedness for the sake of that. And that's why Paul says in, I want to say 1 Timothy, but it, I'm not quite sure, how he says about the love of money is a root towards all kinds of evil things. It leads us in all kinds of wicked things. And, and I think that maybe he, had some, maybe he drew some inspiration from this proverb. By the way, it doesn't really make sense. It's, it's really all throughout uh, the Bible. Uh, not, I'm sorry, it doesn't make, it's not that it doesn't make sense. It does, it's, not that, it's, it, it's that it does not matter. Duh. I misspoke there. So sorry. Verse 21. To show partiality is not good, but for a piece of bread a man will do wrong. Now this one, some people were saying that, you know, people don't like showing partiality, but... If you just give them a, li a little a little bribe, they'll, 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 you know, it won't be that big of a deal. I don't really think that that's what he's saying at all. Boop. I think this is what he's saying. Desperation can drive people to do wrong things. People even know that what they're doing is wrong, but when they're desperate enough, suddenly their morals get a little bit less yeah. solid. Yeah. You know, and I think that's kind of important to remember. You might also be implying, possibly, that you should go be more lenient with people who are in a desperate situation than with people who aren't. Once again, excuse me, that's not ex ex explicitly said, so yeah. shy away from drawing anything too rash, but he might be implying. Possibility. Uh, verse 22. What? Oh, is it locked? Sorry. A uh, stingy man hastens after wealth and, and does not know that poverty will come upon him. Um, there's also here in, in Hebrew, there's a little bit of a word uh, distinction here. Stingy is actually literally the evil eye, the person with an evil eye. So it's translated here as stingy man because earlier the same word was used and it meant stingy there. So here they kind of translated it as stingy. I think evil eye kind of captures it more. The person with the evil eye with wicked desires lead to wicked actions, which leads to disaster. That kind of goes right in hand with the previous uh, proverb, and it really just kind of fits better. Um, a, per a person with, with a wicked eye hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him because his wicked desires lead to wicked actions, which lead to disaster. It's a, it's a process here. Um, verse 23, uh, whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, whoever robs his father or his mother and says this is that is no transgression is a companion to man who destroys. Basically, the idea here is that it's, it, it's it's not good to do that, and it shows your lack of morals, and it shows who you're hanging around with. Uh, verse twenty-five: A greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who th uh, who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. And there's so much that's going on here. Uh, for one, people who uh, trust in the Lord is kind of a requirement that you give up that greed that we were talking about for, for weeks upon weeks. But uh, you, there's just a whole lot of things said here that, that relates to what we talked about before. But without getting too, mis too carried away because of how late it is, let's just go to the main idea here. Trusting in the Lord versus giving way to appetite. You know, when you're in a place of need, 
or when you think that you're in a place of need versus when you're just trusting the Lord with your whole heart. Um, verse 26, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Once again, contrasting wisdom is not just simply having all the answers. Again, it mentions that. Um, is everybody done with the slide? Okay. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get, get many a curse. And the idea here is many a curse potentially from the poor people, but also remember from God too. Generous people do not miss what they give away. If you're a generous person, really generous person, when you give, you don't miss it. If you're a stingy person who's trying to be generous, you give and, and you just kind of, uh, it kind of kills you a little bit inside. And if you're a stingy person fully, you're not struggling at all, you're just, you're just living there, well then you just don't give. <laughs> and it kind of stages there. So that should kind of, as a good way to, to, to test once again your character. When you give... Um, a tithe or offering or whatever it, it could be to somebody who's just in need the whole time that after you give do you sit there worrying about it you sit there overthinking about it you're just like oh I could use that money on something else that's a sign that you're not really a generous person uh, because a generous person here it, you know he, he clarifies there it's not somebody who's going to miss that wealth so don't get too disheartened if, uh, if that is you um, through practice generosity becomes kind of um, a part of who we are so Exodus 22 uh, 21 through 24 says You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. Uh, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat in a widow or a fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Pretty rough there, huh? Yeah. And so the idea here is not necessarily that the poor people will curse them, although that is true. Poor people will curse you when you just ignore their ignore their plights. Um, but God will also bring things by. Now, I do want to do want to get something by here. Not every time that somebody begs, are they a poor person? My, in today's culture, is kind of a little more complicated than all that. There's some people who work the system. Like in California, this is very common. People who beg on side of the street are actually that's their job, and they actually make really good off of it. Um, do you then, remember that one episode of The King of the Hill? Where Bobby started working the streets? Yeah. Because, because these teenagers were doing that. That's hot. That's funny. So he could buy some jeans. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but then also there's some people who just refuse to, to, to work. And for that, it's kind of a little more complicated than that. See, because if sometimes if you help them, it just kind of instills that. You know? Like, uh, I was actually talking with Ben, uh, and there was this one person who, who uh, finally got a job, and Ben even offered to take them to work. They didn't even have to worry about a ride. But, you know, he ended up either quitting or getting fired. I don't remember which. Uh, because he kept skipping work. He kept, uh, if it was raining, he wouldn't go. If there were, you know, if he didn't feel good. If he just didn't feel like going to work. All these different things. So either he ended up getting fired or he, or he, or he quit. I forget which. But, you know, that that's kind of goes hand in hand with this. You know, where sometimes people are poor just because they refuse to do what they know is right. And... That's a little bit more of a complicated situation. Do you help them or do you not? Typically, I would say no. And, Are you helping them, though? Yeah, and there's a thing, too. That's why I would say typically no, because you're usually just helping them to get that instilled in them. But then also, um, uh, I, say, I, I say that because that's pastor's view, and as an associate pastor, I think it's kind of my um, place to reinforce the teachings that he says at church. And this one I, 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 I totally uh, think should be mentioned here. Um, in fact, Pastor has multiple times had to ask people not to give to some people who come into the church asking for money because of a few reasons. A, it makes things awkward for them. They don't come back. Um, so that's A and B right there. It makes things awkward for them and they don't come back. And then also C, because he's trying to teach them how to grow and how to mature in an area that is very apathetic towards progress. Tularosa is one of the only places I've ever been that is so hell-bent on not being mature and responsible. I've never been somewhere like this. And so as a result, as Christians, we have to change how we do things here rather than how we do some things somewhere else because we have a different audience here than we have somewhere else. So, um, without getting too far off topic, I'm sorry if that was off topic. So the last verse here, chapter 28. When the wicked rise, people hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. And that's been said a couple of times in this chapter. So, kind of, righteousness must outlast wickedness. 
um, actually notice that last verse there. But when they perish, the righteous increase. Not rejoice, increase. Um, righteousness must outlast wickedness. As a pastor, how do you know when, when, you, when you should leave? When the job's done. When your job is done. As a Christian, how do you know when you should just move out of the city, move out of the state, move out of the country? It's just too wicked. When you've outlasted wickedness. <laughs> Righteous people have to outlast the wickedness of their culture. And then, when they do, it will yield more righteousness. People will be changed by that. When the wicked rise, people hide themselves. But when they perish, the righteous increase. So you have to endure those, those, those things. So the question of the week here. Um, are you wise by doing the things in Proverbs, or do you do the things in Proverbs because you are wise? Is it something that naturally happens if you're a wise person? Is it something that a fool has to study in order to become wise? And if so, how do you understand it if you're a fool because a fool can't understand the wisdom? So think about this. I really want some, some genuine, some genuine heartfelt analysis here. Analysis. There we go.